Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a really terrific new recording of the Beethoven and Brahms Violin Concertos together on a single disc, which tells you that the tempi will be rather swift, and that's a good thing. As it turns out, the soloist is Gil Shaham, the orchestra is The Knights, conducted by Eric Jacobson, and the label is Shaham's own, Canary Classics. So hereby hangs a tale that really is, I think, fascinating, a fascinating statement on the state of the record industry as it is today. And then we'll get to the performances and I'll be able to play samples courtesy and with permission of Canary Classics. So thank you, Canary Classics, for your permission to use some samples of these really splendid performances. But first, let's talk about this. The Beethoven and the Brahms Concerti are, of course, iconic. Every major violinist does them, sometimes multiple times. In fact, Shaham himself has already recorded the Brahms Concerto with Claudio Abbado and the Berlin Philharmonic, no less, for Deutsche Grammophon. So doing it again takes a certain amount of cojones, as they say in the biz. It really does, and especially to compare with that version, which is superb. It's one of the great modern versions of the piece. But this album is an album. It's a thing, a complete unity, and I want to explain to you why that's so. First of all, the two works are, are joined at the hip by the presence of the illustrious 19th century violinist Josef Joachim. It was Joachim's performance of the Beethoven with Mendelssohn in London in the 1840s, I think it was, or somewhere around there. The date is in the notes, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, that revived the Beethoven Concerto, because you have to remember, in those days, violin concertos were written by virtuoso violinists for their own use. They did not play other people's music as a rule. And so the Beethoven, which itself is almost anti-virtuosic in, in a lot of ways, it's of course extremely difficult or intellectually challenging musically, but from the point of view of fiddle technique, it ain't Paganini, right? Let's, let's face it, it's not. And so and so the Beethoven was lying sort of in a, in, in, on a shelf until Joachim got his hands on it with Mendelssohn and made it his calling card. And that essentially put the piece into the international repertoire. Now, Brahms saw Joachim perform the work and was, of course, dazzled, or so he probably claimed. And he wrote his own violin concerto for Joachim. And in a sense, at least as far as the violin part went, in collaboration with Joachim to make sure to get all the passage work right and all the virtuoso effects right. It's a much more virtuoso work um, on its face than the Beethoven concerto is, although it's no less demanding in terms of the soloist taste and musicianship and all of those supposedly higher qualities that are required to perform the music well. So the two are related and the very smart people at Canary Classics have made sure we know this. How? Well, here's another story. First of all, first of all, I have to just tell you, the, the way that this is packaged is pretty cool. I mean, there's, you know, one of these plastic things with the disc attached to it. And then there's a booklet in the slipcase. And this slipcase does not open this way. It opens from the inside, which makes it impossible to get the booklet out without tearing the thing open practically. So what you need in order to do it is a tool, which I happen to have. I bought these not as like eyebrow pluckers or other things like that. These little tweezer scissors, I bought them solely for the purpose of removing CDs and inside booklets without damaging these flimsy cardboard things, which are very ecological and I understand all that. So here's how we do it. We put them in here and we very carefully remove this. See, it's like playing that that game. What was it called? Operation or whatever it is where you had to take little tweezers and take out like the body parts without touching the metal sides and then the, the patient's nose would light up and he would be dead and you'd lose the game. It's sort of like that. Or you can use just a pair of tweezers, whatever works, but you need something to get this out. But it's worth getting it out because once you get it out, I like doing this, 
I turned the air conditioner off, you know, to do this so there wouldn't be noise and it's hotter than hell in here. So once you get this out, you find a superb, and I mean superb, as if, as if you know, the, the golden age of recordings had returned for a moment. Superb note by Brahms scholar and very close personal friend of mine, I have to admit, Styra Avens, who is a fabulous writer and a wonderful Brahms scholar and a jo Joachim authority as well. And she has written a fabulous, fabulous multi-page essay on the history of these two concertos and their relationship to Joseph Joachim. In other words, she explains why this is an album a total package, not just your, you know, another Brahms and another Beethoven. They are together for a reason. They work together for that reason. And that is marvelous. And it's hardly ever done anymore. And it goes to show you what can happen when you have a private label, a small private label, artist run, that gets it right. And when you see something like this, when you see a product like this, first of all, I feel that I should tell everyone to go buy it immediately because it deserves your support. When someone gets it right like that, aside from the packaging nonsense, which, you know, you can deal with. One of these ought to come with this, by the way. But when someone takes the trouble to do it that way, it deserves our wholehearted, full-throated, enthusiastic support just on principle. And you really have to wonder why other, you know, artists or small private labels and whatnot so seldom do this so well, because this is, this is just a perfect production, I have to say. So anyway, you get this marvelous booklet, just like the good old days that have that has fabulous notes and explanation and descriptions of the works. And that in itself is a joy. It's such a joy. So uh, congratulations on the folks at Canary Classics who had the perspicacity to ask Styra Avens to contribute the essay and then to put together this beautiful package. So that's the notes and the booklet and the packaging and presentation. Now let's talk about the performances. First, the orchestra. Who are the knights? That's the orchestra, the knights under, under Eric Jacobson here. Well, the Knights, it says here, wait a minute, let's look at the little bookie, because it tells you who everyone are. The Knights are a collective of adventurous music musicians dedicated to transfer, transforming the orchestral experience and eliminating barriers between audiences and music. All right, so everybody says that. I mean, the major orchestras have whole departments that are dedicated to doing just that outreach and all this stuff. It's like, I, I'm not going to get into how successful they are or how, you know, intense their efforts are. I'm sure they are. And they're right here in Brooklyn. They are my hometown team or one of them. And they play splendidly. They're a wonderful group, but I cannot call them a collective because I'm an old like Star Trek geek. And the only collective I care about is the Borg. And of course, as we all know, the Borg are cubic and monumentally evil, and and the conductor is not locutus of Borg, and so I am not dealing with the collective. They are a chamber orchestra, a very fine chamber orchestra. And for these performances, the orchestra consists of seven first, seven second violins. So it's seven, seven, uh, I think four, four, and three. Four violas, four cellos, and three double basses along with all of the necessary yeah oh wait but five yeah four violas four cellos yeah got it along with all of the other necessary winds and brass and timpani and that is an excellent size to play these works because of course these violin concertos yeah violin concertos generally always have balance issues and they are splendidly recorded beautifully engineered performances that permit a wonderful wonderful chamber music-like give and take between the orchestra and Gil Shaham. And I'm going to give you an example of that from the Beethoven. You know, the Beethoven, like I said, the tempi here are generally swift, which I think is wonderful. It's wonderful in that you have that kind of intimacy of chamber music, but with no dawdling, which is just great. 
often you can have, you know, that sort of, that sort of, you know, well, it gets narcissistic. You know what I mean, right? Especially these days where soloists are desperate to do anything different and they don't care how bizarre or grotesque it is as long as it's different. This isn't like that. This is musicianship, folks. Really fine musicianship. And so here's a bit of the, the Beethoven, the first movement, coming from the, the second subject in the recapitulation. Um, so you can hear... Uh, Mr. Shaham and the orchestra making love. It's absolutely wonderful. And another wonderful thing I must say is that you have a real conductor. This is not one of those, you know, um, I'm a soloist and I'm going to lead the orchestra from my piano or violin or whatever. These pieces require conductors. They need a leader and you can only benefit from the interaction between the leader and the soloist. So here's a bit of the Beethoven and you'll get exactly the sense of what I mean. A beautiful dialogue that does not preclude a flexibility of pulse, but that always keeps the long singing line moving. Ah, it's gorgeous. Here you go. Now, when you add to that the absolutely radiant playing of the orchestra, particularly the woodwind section, which is beautifully in tune, and I mean, that's what this concerto is about. You know, the concerto itself is about radiant serenity, by and large. That's what makes it so atypical as a virtuoso vehicle, and that's why nobody played it for many decades after it was written, until Joachim picked it up with Mendelssohn, because it's only suitable if you are into higher musical values rather than rather than simple showmanship. And so and so the showmanship is there. As you can hear, even there, you know, all of the writing in high positions, the beautiful interplay of texture. And I want to play you also a bit of the finale, because the finale is usually the movement that kills most performances. You know, it's almost always taken a bit too slowly. I don't know why. I don't know why that should be the case. I think some people or some musicians think perhaps that the music's very lightness is somehow unsuited to a work of this of this significance and this weight, because remember, the first movement, especially in most performances, is terribly, terribly long. I mean, it's really longer than the rest of the, the other two movements of the concerto put together. Usually it lasts about 25 minutes or so, 23 to 25 minutes. Here it's 21, 21, 22, 21 minutes, 22 seconds. And you never ever get a sense that it's rushing, but by the same token, it just sounds so nice to have it move properly. And that means that the finale can move along smartly as well. It doesn't have to just lay there like, 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 a, like a rotten egg or something, you know, it's not dead. Here's a bit of the, the opening of the finale that I think will give you a good sense of it, as well as the, um, the attractiveness of the orchestra and the orchestral sonority, which is really quite lovely in these works. Here you go.
beautiful. I think that's marvelous. I really do. And uh, the truth of the matter is we haven't had performances of this kind of fleetness that are not period instrument type performances really since like Heifetz. You know, Heifetz played everything rather quickly or tended to play everything rather quickly. And he mostly got his conductors and orchestras to come along for the ride. But here you get a sense that there's a real identity of, of interest between the conductor and the orchestra, and everyone's having a rollicking good time. And that's what matters now. So that's the Beethoven. And it's worth pointing out also that Shaham has not recorded the Beethoven before now. And so it's particularly salutary that he does such a fine job of it. It's a new item in his discography because Deutsche Grammophon never got around to doing it with him back in the day. They did the Brahms, but not the Beethoven. They should have done the Beethoven, but you know they had 400 versions of the Beethoven. So you can kind of understand. I'm very, very happy that he was able to do it under what I assume were virtually ideal circumstances and on his own label because that means he can keep it in print and keep it available instead of doing what Deutsche Grammophon did, which is delete everything, then stuff it in a box, and you know you know how it goes. So now we come to the Brahms, which Shaham has recorded before, a very, very beautiful performance with the Bado and the Berlin Philharmonic, which this one does not resemble, which is great because there's a reason to do it again. Partly that reason is because it's part of the album the entirety of the Joachim experience that this particular coupling documents, and partly it's because the interpretation is quite different. It is more similar to the interpretation of the Beethoven that is quicker and lighter in texture and more transparent in sonority, not necessarily better. You can play this this concerto, I, mean, I don't need to tell you, you can play this concerto in a very romantic way as so many great great violinists have, David Oistrach and Nathan Milstein and, you know, all the biggies. They all did it and they did it very, very, very well. So there's no point in making invidious comparisons. My point is that Shaham, in comparison to himself, justifies doing it again because he's doing it differently. And that is critically important, but not worse. It's a wonderful comparison, actually, to listen to the two versions. I wish I had permission to use the DG recordings because then I could give you some A-B comparisons. But if you have them, you can you can do that yourself. I do want to play three examples from the Brahms here, I believe. Yeah, there are three. The first is is just the opening the opening orchestral tutti because I really think it shows off how well the the, the knights do the music. What an important contribution they make. We cannot forget the conductor and the orchestra in this music. They're every bit as important, particularly in the Brahms, which is a real dialogue between the piano, between the piano, between the violin and the orchestra. Often it's the piano and Brahms, but not in this case. Here's the opening, the opening ritornello, the orchestral introduction, just played by the Knights. particularly like about that is you know you know how Brahms gets right it's very very beautiful that he arrives at his big first tutti and the orchestral sonority kind of congeals and he begins to get kind of glumpy you know the opening of the second symphony does the same thing you know when it finally gets loud right it's da 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 da
this does the same thing, right? Da 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 ba ba da 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 u cha 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 ba ba ba. You know, he just starts to like jump up and down in one place, and it can really sound kind of silly if the orchestration is too thick and the rhythm isn't clear. And here, as you heard, I mean, the rhythms were really snappy, and the tra the the textures were were. Beautifully transparent, and it never sounds like Brahms is just sort of stomping around, wondering what to do next, which it often does, at least in my opinion. So that I really, really enjoyed. And now I want to play you just a sample of the end of the solo cadenza, which of course is Joachim's, um, and the re-entry of the orchestra, and just the the beautiful, beautiful interplay between Shaham and the woodwinds, the solo woodwinds. It's just a moment of, of pure poetry in this performance. And it's something that throughout these performances, the players do incredibly well. There's just that fantastic feeling of rapport and, and chamber music like back and forth exchange between the soloist and the orchestra. So here's a bit of the, the virtuoso cadenza and the re-entry of the orchestra and the ensuing dialogue. Here you go. Wasn't that just exquisite? I mean, I know it's such a such an affected term. It's like, oh, it's so exquisite. But you know, it's the right word in the right place sometimes. That was exquisite. It was absolutely gorgeous, fantastic. And again, there's no hint of of metronomic. You know, it's period instrument. It has to be this tempo, and you have to use this thing, and it has to be that. But yeah, you know what I mean, right? There's there's complete flexibility and freedom in the phrasing, and just just a lovely feeling of musicians making music together, which is wonderful. And you even hear that at quick tempos, which is remarkable because it's a lot harder when the music's going fast. And so I'm going to play at the end of the concerto, the coda, the coda to the last movement, where they're all just skipping along top speed and having a grand old time and it just sounds as carefree and dazzling as anyone has ever done it and with absolutely perfect perfect rhythm i love the feeling of rhythm in this performance it's so not Brahmsian. Well, I mean, it should be Brahmsian. Brahms is supposed to have rhythm. Brahms had enormously sophisticated rhythm. He's just often not played that way. But here, his rhythm is absolutely toe-tapping. So here is the end of the concerto.
Yes, you may now applaud. That was Gil Shaham with The Knights under conductor Eric Jacobson in the conclusion of the Brahms Violin Concerto. Superbly played. I, I think this is one of the absolute discs of the year. It is wonderful. And like I said, it's on Shaham's own label, Canary Classics, for whom, once again, I have to extend my heartfelt, my heartfelt thanks for permission to play samples. I, I really hope that you all support this label and this performance particularly because it really shows the best of what can happen now that the major labels have all tanked and we have fabulous, fabulous artists without recording contracts with major labels. They have to do it themselves. I know that they're strapped for money. I know that making physical product these days and selling physical product is an ordeal. Everything is moving to the internet, but they took the time to put together an album in which, which at every point, except the damn packaging with this thing in the middle, but at every artistic point, is absolutely superior from the orchestra to the soloist to the notes in the booklet they've just gotten it right and we should applaud that great work folks just terrific from soup to nuts so keep on listening folks thanks so much for your time and attention take care